Welcome to Australia. This is one of the most fire-prone regions on Earth. And we're here at the peak of the wildfire season. Whoa, whoa, whoa! This all of a sudden flames erupted on this side of the road. We've been given incredible access to one of the world's biggest firefighting forces at its busiest time of the year. Oh, look out. Every day, 70,000 firefighters can be battling more than 100 fires across an area bigger than France. We're following their operations to find out why there are so many wildfires here and why they're so hard to control. Main burn is on now. And meeting the scientists uncovering the secrets of fire behaviour to help those on the front line. And actually it's starting to smoke. What is smoking? In this first programme, we'll explore the rapid response system developed to protect New South Wales. There's 1,162 firefighters, 422 vehicles. Those are people actually out? Yep, absolutely deployed on those fires. Wow. We'll reveal the surprising way fires ignite. The lightning channel generates a big pressure wave. And how they spread. Bits and pieces of the bark have come off and has started a spot fire. So yeah. it didn't just jump the little break, no. it jumped quite a big distance. It did. And we'll investigate the technology being used to find the fires that can't be seen. Amongst all the foliage there, yeah. there's patches of green. And yeah. green means... Green means heat. The camera shows us exactly where to go. The lessons learnt in Australia are helping firefighters tackle wildfires across the world. Wildfires are one of the most powerful and terrifying events on the planet, and we're going to be going right to their heart. To learn more about wildfires, we've come here to New South Wales in Eastern Australia. It's home to Sydney and beautiful beaches, but also stunning mountains, open grassland and ancient forests. Each year, from October through to March, New South Wales suffers some of the most intense wildfires in Australia. This state spans a vast 800,000 square kilometres, so we're splitting up to follow all aspects of the operation. I'm heading west to join frontline teams in fire-prone regions, while Kate heads to Sydney, HQ of the Rural Fire Service, to meet Head of Operations, Rob Rogers. We're getting reports it's burning again. I've arrived at the end of a record-breaking heat wave, with peak temperatures reaching as high as 45 degrees. So the screens up here, everything that's listed in these two panels, are those current fires? Yeah. So, so all of the blue dots on the map represent a fire. Right. Um, and an incident that is being managed. There's 101 bush and grass fires at the moment. There's 1,162 firefighters, 422 vehicles. Those are people actually out? Yep, absolutely deployed on those fires. Wow. There's an enormous number of people that are committed, you know, just today on firefighting operations throughout the state. To coordinate the action, the HQ employs 300 staff. It seems to me that this is almost like a war office, that you're standing here looking at kind of battles mm. breaking out. At the end of the day, you've got all these little skirmishes, which are fires that are mm -hmm. occurring. Sometimes they evolve to a point where it's a major event, um, and that becomes like a major battle, I guess. Um, and we're sending a lot of resources into, a, into an area in a very short space of time, trying to contain something, um, which is very much like the military do. What's surprising about the firefight in New South Wales is that they're not just contending with one or two big wildfires, but over a hundred smaller ones too, each with the potential to spread. Today, the operation spans a high-intensity blaze in a pine plantation. A fast-moving grassland fire in the north, threatening the major highway connecting Brisbane and Sydney and a fire twice the size of Birmingham that's been slowly burning for a month in remote bushland. We've all seen footage mm. on the TV, and this year in New South mm. Wales has been particularly 
particularly bad. Back in October, we were starting to lose property. We were quite concerned about people's lives. We had firefighters from Victoria, South Australia, ACT and Queensland. So right. they all came and helped us when we were very busy um, because we had obviously um, a lot of fire throughout mm. the state and mm. particularly in the urban areas. So um, we were very quite stretched. These so-called October fires tore through the Blue Mountains just outside Sydney at the start of the season. For five days, New South Wales was declared a state of emergency, while more than 1,300 firefighters battled the flames. Despite their efforts, the fires destroyed over 200 homes and did over 50 million pounds worth of damage. Amazingly, no one died. One reason this fire season has been so bad is the weather. 2013 was the hottest year on record in Australia, and this year seems to be continuing the trend. Wildfires, or bushfires as they're known here, are so dependent on weather that the Rural Fire Service has its own in-house forecaster, Simon Lewis. So can you explain what the correlation is, the connection between weather and fires breaking out? Weather really is critical for determining the amount of fire activity. The weather on any particular day can make the fire behaviour much worse, but there's also the long-term effect of the weather. Um, so over a period of time, um, if we have uh, drought conditions, so very dry, that acts to dry out the forests, um, the forest fuels, and also the grass fuels. Wildfires, like all fires, occur when fuel combines with oxygen and heat in a chemical chain reaction that gives off energy. The drier the fuel, in this case the parched trees and grasses, the quicker it will ignite and the more intensely it will burn. When we're looking at fire weather, we're looking at three main weather ingredients. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is temperature, the second is the relative humidity, when it's very hot and dry. Uh, that acts to dry out the fine fuels, um, which increases the intensity at which the fires burn. The third ingredient we look for is the wind speed. The stronger the winds we get, the faster that pushes the fire along. So why is there a, a sense of urgency in here today? Based on the forecast of temperature, wind and humidity for today, we've determined that the overall fire danger is quite high um, and we do have fire weather warnings current. Simon's weather warning is key to fire prevention. So yeah, 36. Easterly. Yeah, wind sprints up a bit there, up mm -hmm. 40 kg. Mm -hmm. The Rural Fire Service enforce their highest level of precaution. Just advising total fire events for tomorrow. We've got southern ranges, central ranges. A total fire ban is designed to prevent residents from starting fires by mistake. So just checking you're aware of the total fire ban. It's now illegal to use solid fuel barbecues or machinery that could create sparks capable of igniting the dry land. Thanks, sir. Bye-bye. Breaking the ban could result in a hefty fine or jail. It may seem strict, but it's essential. Up to 85% of all wildfires in Australia are started by people. With the chance of fires so high, it's critical to spot them early. So the Rural Fire Service mobilise a team of key personnel. I've come to see one of them in action in Galston, just north of Sydney. Paul is a fire spotter. He helped build this tower 40 years ago and ever since has been on call to scan the horizon when the danger of fire is high. What's, what's this intriguing piece of kit? We call it a sighting scope. Mm -hmm. On seeing a column of smoke, as we can see at the moment in the distance... Hang on a second. I... <laughs> Where's the smoke? So... You are eagle-eyed, aren't you? Oh, yeah, there so is. So if you look through there, yeah. and you might have to move it, so you point so do, exactly... Do you, do you want the cross actually on the smoke? Is that yes, what you try to do? that's the origin Ooh. of the smoke. OK. Actually, there is quite a lot of smoke, isn't there? Yes. Does that give you cause for concern? That being only a very light-coloured smoke, it'd be just something like a backyard 
burning pile of rubbish. Right. If that column of smoke goes to a brown colour, a light brown, then a dark and then into a black, that generally means the fire has escaped perhaps into the bush and that becomes what they then call a going fire. And so you're not just spotting the smoke, no. you're actually analysing it That's and true. knowing from your years of experience yes. what type of fire it is. It is, yes. Firecom, uh, this is Golston Tower, yellow, with a smoke siding, and uh, it's just a steady rising column. Over. If this fire starts to spread, he'll report in again, and ground and aerial firefighters will be sent to put the blaze out. This is one of 50 lookout towers strategically placed across the state of New South Wales to protect towns and cities. For eight decades, fire spotters like Paul have played an indispensable role in feeding back crucial information to the rural fire service. But today, modern technology is turning everyone into a fire spotter. Social media has become a real tool for us because everyone has the ability to share intelligence. Uh, people these days are tweeting pictures uh, very quickly. The Twitter feed is now so important, it takes up a place on the main information board. This is a fire that started out on the, on the Castle Ray Highway. What they have done, they have tagged us, so at least we've actually been able to at least see that picture internally here. We can see it it's, hasn't crossed the road at this stage. It is starting to build in momentum. It is going to cause some traffic delays. Photos are brilliant because with them sometimes uh, you, you can get the geotagging out of it so we can actually pop it on a map. The Rural Fire Service relay this information to one of 50 regional control centres who deploy the nearest crews. And with weather conditions perfect for fires to spread, Simon is finding out why every second counts in the fight against wildfires. We're on our way to a fire, we're following a fire truck ahead. We think that there are several other fire trucks and crews already working on the fire, and they're saying they may have to call in air support. I'm en route to a fire that's just been reported near the small town of Wattle Flat in Bathurst. We can see the smoke through the trees now. The fire's just here, let's see if we can stop and get close to it. With the town just five kilometres away, 15 firefighters have been dispatched to protect its 363 residents. Are you one of the RFS guys or is it your land? Uh, I just found a farm at the bottom of the hill. You warned them. Uh, yeah, we were in the fire brigade and then we came up. Every minute counts, I suppose. So you live how far away? You're presumably always on the alert for it. Yeah, for sure. Oh, look out. Right side whoa, right whoa, 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 whoa. What's your footing? Just suddenly the flames erupted on this side of the road. There's a firefighter, he's gone down the bank. He's got the hose down there. You're right, Alex. They really have to throw themselves into danger to try and get the fire out. You can see the smoke coming off it. Just 30 seconds, a minute ago, there was nothing going on here. Right. The firefighters here have a vested interest in saving the land. They're all local volunteers. Oh, I don't know. You ain't got that. Yep. Um, They're part of a 70,000 strong volunteer force spread across the state, on call throughout fire season. Yeah, I've got this here now, that's good cooking. You're right? Yeah, I'm all right, mate. This team is led by Andrew Seaman. Hello there, sir. How are you? Are you a volunteer? Yep. What's your normal, normal uh, occupation? I'm a grazier around here, yeah. Grazier, sheep, coffee, climbing, yeah. So you're on the land? On the land. What's the aim of firefighting in a situation like this? Well, we've got to get it out before it gets too hot. Like if you get into the scrub on the other side, I know that place is, and there's two and a half thousand acres of scrub.
Stamping out this fire before it starts to spread further into the scrub is crucial. A key characteristic of wildfire is its ability to move and spread rapidly from its source. Got a chopper coming in now. It looks like they're coming into water bomb. Whoa! That just dropped about 20 metres ahead of us. Bloody useful having them up there, isn't it? Helicopters have been dispatched by RFS HQ. They dumped 650 litre buckets of water on the fastest moving parts of the fire, while the volunteers extinguished the smouldering areas left behind. How much of a problem is are the fires at this this time of year? Oh, big problem. This is the second one today, and we had five yesterday up the road. The crew believe this fire was started by a resident. Fortunately, their speedy response has enabled them to suppress it within 30 minutes. So the fire's under control? Yep, yep, we're on top of it now, yep. Success? Yeah, thank you. hot here now. We're on the edge of the Willamine National Park. We're heading into the park now. See another side of the firefighting operation. The Wollamai is 80 kilometers northwest of Sydney and borders the northern edge of the Blue Mountains. This landscape is carpeted with 70 different species of eucalyptus tree. When the temperature rises, they release vapour into the air, creating a blue haze which gives the region its name. They might be beautiful to look at, but eucalyptus trees are among the most flammable on Earth. And they're another major reason why wildfires are such a problem in New South Wales. It's stunning, absolutely stunning. Great to look at, but it's bloody hard work to fight fires in it, let me tell you. <laughs> David Crust, affectionately known as Krusty, should know. He's been leading a team battling wildfires in this 5,000 square kilometre wilderness for 100 days straight. The largest fire began five weeks ago. So far, it's consumed 440 square kilometres of forest. It's taken 74 firefighters and seven choppers to get it under control. Today, teams are working to dampen down the last of the embers. So the crews have been inserted. See that flat rock shelf down the bottom there? Right. So we flew them into there and then they've walked upslope from there. They're trawling away like little ants. Must be, it must be extremely hard. It is. It's uh, really challenging the guys to get around. And it's really hot today. From up here, I get my first look at the incredible scale of the destruction. Down beneath us now, I can see the trees have been completely scorched and blackened. The canopy looks as though it's been singed, but the trees and the ground has rarely burnt. It's a terrible scar. Although these eucalyptus trees may look dead, in time they'll recover. They've been living with wildfire for millions of years and they've evolved ways to survive. But around 50 kilometers away are a unique group of trees for whom fire could be fatal. Krusty is desperate to protect them. Amazingly, in 1994, a fellow ranger, a guy called Dave Noble, was exploring some of the canyons around this area. He found a specimen, something that he thought that was pretty unusual. Took it home, showed it to a botanist. The botanist went, whoa, how about this? This looks just like this amazing fossil record from the Jurassic period, and it turned out to be a new species, the Wollamai pine. This is the only place on Earth that the Wollamai pine occurs, in this particular canyon system in Wollamai National <laughs> Park. That, that's, that's spectacular. The exact location of the Wollamai Pines remains a closely guarded state secret. 
to all of my fans. Yeah, uh, the dinosaur tree. Wallamai pines have survived here for more than 200 million years. They're a living relic of the Jurassic Age. It's like a, a lost world down there. It is. The pines actually do look rather special. They look different, they stand out, they look majestic. And they reach a hell of a height as well. They're big trees. They're big, majestic trees. There's uh, a big tree there we call King Billy, that one there. King Billy. King. He's got a name. He must be up, what, 40 metres? Yeah, he's, uh, he's about 40, 44 metres high, so it's a big tree. The pines have been preserved in a small prehistoric wetland at the base of this canyon. So far, it's remained untouched by wildfire. But with this being the worst fire season in a decade, Krusty must be ever watchful. If you had a wildfire coming through here, threatening the pines, what sort of damage could it do? Presumably, it could wipe them out. Yeah, it's possible that it could result in some sort of extinction. You know, we're very mindful of that, and it's really important that we manage fire actively to make sure that doesn't happen. Already this season, the wildfires have torched 700 square kilometres of the Wallamai. That's an area almost twice the size of the new forest. And in this remote place, the majority was started not by humans, but by a force that's much harder to control. Lightning is responsible for more than two thirds of the wildfires in Wallamai Park. But to find out why it's such a fearsome fire starter, I need to leave the bush and head for the lab. Just so I understand, this is a lightning chamber? Yes, the lightning current will rush through here. And when it reaches that point, it will jump to this tree, which is our test object today. Professor Manu Haddad, one of the world's leading lightning scientists, normally uses his equipment to test the impact of lightning strikes on aeroplane parts. But today he's running a unique experiment. When a lightning strike hits a tree, it will follow a certain path along the tree, and this is what we're trying to replicate today. As in the Wallamai, the target of our lightning bolt is a eucalyptus tree, and to replicate the leaf litter found on the forest floor, dead leaves are scattered at its base. How are we going to be able to see what happens? I'm presuming we're not going to be able to stand here while this is going on, are we? No, we go in a safe area. In order to monitor it, the lightning strike is happening in a millionth of a second, so what is called microseconds. And a normal camera wouldn't see much. Uh, so we use a very high-speed camera, and then that way we can look at the frames at a millionth of a second. This kind of experiment would be impossible to do in the wild. The special camera should allow us to examine what happens at the moment of ignition in minute detail. And what do you think is going to happen to the tree? We may get ignition. To recreate one of nature's most powerful forces, they're charging up the lightning chamber to 55,000 volts. When unleashed, the lightning bolt would deliver an electrical charge of 30,000 amps straight to the tree. For that instant, the power is equivalent to the output of an entire nuclear power station. Three, two, one. It's incredible. They, they, it seemed to explode in there. It's hard to see exactly what happened in real time. But the slow motion footage reveals all. Look at the. It erupts at the bottom. That's an incredible sight to see. Can we see it again? This is extraordinary. Talk us through what we're seeing here. As lightning strike hits those trees, the heat actually ignited those leaves. The temperature reaches more than 30,000 degrees centigrade. 
But what this experiment reveals is that it's not just heat that causes fires. The lightning channel generates a big pressure wave which throws things away from it. And that fire is even ejected elsewhere and it's actually like fireballs that live on fire and it's just going further away from the tree. And if there had been dry, dead leaf material around there, as there would be in, in the natural world, this is going to start a blaze. Yep. This experiment clearly demonstrates that the explosive force of a lightning bolt can create not only one fire, but many. And this is just one bolt hitting one tree. Every year, New South Wales is hit by an estimated 1.5 million lightning strikes. Because lightning can so easily start fires, the Rural Fire Service must constantly track the movement of thunderstorms across New South Wales. Forecaster Simon Lewis knows that some types of storms are particularly threatening. Over the last few days, we've had quite a lot of thunderstorm activity, uh, and that with that, we've seen what we call some dry lightning, which occurs when you've very dry air underneath them. And what, what you see is that the rain will evaporate before it reaches the ground. Unlike normal thunderstorms, the rain in dry lightning storms never reaches the flames. In that situation, if you get lightning with no rain, then that can ignite new fires. It's not simply the threat of lightning the firefighters need to worry about. Overnight, a storm has struck at the Wallamai. Krusty now needs to find any new fires started by lightning before they take hold. With 5,000 square kilometres of thick eucalyptus forest, that's no easy task. I've returned there to see a key piece of technology he uses to help him. We've got really good lightning detection systems, so we know where the lightning occurs. We look for ignitions and fires. Once the storm passes through, Krusty's team take to the skies. But how do you find them? We've got what's called a FLIR camera, a forward-looking infrared camera that picks up heat in the infrared spectrum. This infrared camera, originally designed for the military, has been used to find fires in the Wallamai for nearly a decade. The helicopter and the operator have flown really low and slow, and anything that's registered as a hotspot, they've taken this image of, so we'll just bring one of these guys up. Filmed from 200 metres above, the images reveal small fires called hotspots ignited by lightning. And depending on the quality of the image, we can generally see what it is. There's a, a bit of active fire there. So um, I can see, well, we can see there's a lot of tree coverage there. Absolutely. So it's, it's looking through the trees. Very but, difficult, very difficult to look through with the, with the naked eye. Yeah. But amongst all the, the canopy and the foliage there, yeah. there's patches of green. And yeah. green means... Green means heat. And not all this heat is from fires burning on the ground. Surprisingly, some fires are actually hidden inside logs or tree trunks. You know, the great thing about this is that you wouldn't necessarily see this from the ground. Mm. You know, the log's burning inside. Uh, it may not be putting out smoke. That's fascinating. I'd never have thought of that. So something that's burning away deep inside the tree may not be obvious that it's on, on fire. But the camera tells us that there's an issue there and it shows us exactly where to go. The thermal imaging camera has identified the exact locations of 12 dangerous hotspots that need to be dealt with quickly. Um, there's four crews, there's a few hotspots. The plan is to put the crews onto those hotspots. We're seeing really, really significant fire behaviour quite quickly. Just be really careful. Everybody knows what they're doing. Go and get your gear together, head out to the helipad. This team works for the National Park Service. For six months of the year during fire season, they become airborne firefighters. 
It's not a job for the faint-hearted. The teams are winched down 20-metre wires carrying chainsaws and rakes into the forest below. Luckily for me, we've been deployed to a hotspot close to a place our helicopter can land. Oh, there's a bit of smoke that's just popped up on the horizon over there. So it's quite faint on the, um, well, maybe a few hundred metres out. Shall we head over there? Yeah, you load, shall we? Roger. The tree we're targeting is only 500 metres away, but in these conditions, it feels like miles. It's scorching hot. And this terrain, my goodness, it is tough to move around in. I, I actually find it a little bit frightening. It's, it's overwhelming because if there was a fire coming through here, when you're not in this, in this sort of terrain, you think, oh, you just run from it. But you cannot run through this. You cannot move quickly through it. It takes one and a half hours to reach our goal. Oh, there's smoke just here. Yeah, so we've got a, a tree that's obviously caught on fire. It's still burning up high. Lightning doesn't only ignite a tree's leaves, it can also ignite its trunk. And because eucalyptus is a slow-burning fuel, it's possible a fire like this could lurk burning in the belly of the tree for as long as three months. So the fire is burning from the top down. From the top down, like a candle. That's incredible. And the liquid that's coming out is the, the sap of the, the tree? The sap or? of the tree, the life of the tree. It's like blood, the blood of the yeah, tree. it looks like the blood. You feel sorry for cutting down the big ones, I reckon. They've taken years to grow. And mm. Your yeah. job is to protect them, not Well, not I might down. cut down one, but I might save oh. another 10,000. Actually, when it's on the ground like this, you really do see it smoking away. Immediately, the fire escapes the tree and ignites the dead leaves, known as leaf litter, on the forest floor. I can see what could have happened if the tree had been left and why it's so important to put it out. Well, if you just get your rako in there and spread that stuff apart, it just helps the water to get down into it, cool it off a bit quicker, separate it all. This is the mat we use just to make it a bit easy for the helicopters to um, see our target. Rake it out? Yeah, but don't rake it onto those dry leaves. Because then... cures a bush fire. I don't want that. So just rake it down? Yeah. That's pretty good. I'll, um, I'll get onto the helicopter and see if we can get a bucket dropped on this and cool it down a bit more. To assist with the remote firefighting effort, Krusty has set up a temporary airbase on the outskirts of the park. Here, a refueling tanker supplies a squadron of five helicopters. They scoop up water from creeks and billabongs before flying to join us. Yeah, that's Ofer and Mark. We're ready for a bucket now. Copy, mate. I'll call you in. So they're coming in now with a bucket of water. We need to get out of the way. Yeah, mate. I'm on your one o'clock, 100 meters. It's right above. That is spot on. Hit the entire area. Blanketed it, covered it in water. Do I need to go in there with a rake now? You've got to hit it again two times. So it really needs that much to make sure it's completely out. Wow. Yeah. There it goes! Go 
third shot. Are you happy with that? We'll give it a rake, and then we'll probably get a couple more on it. A couple more? Yeah, come and look how much heat's in it still. Still smoking. So I so see there's still flame coming out of there. That's, that's, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, you've just dropped a huge quantity of water. Probably about 1,600 litres just went down onto it then. But all this sort of timber protects that from getting Of course doused, it does, so, of course you know, it does. Yeah. I should help you rather than just watching. It's only sort of late in the afternoon that this stuff pops up as well. Why is that? Well, the temperature comes up, the humidity comes down. So when you get the balance right between the two, it ignites the bush again. <laughs> So what we might do is stand it up, try and get the water down into that. OK. Beautiful. Anything like this has the potential to spark it up and keep it going. So these are the really important things. OK. So, yeah, we'll call them in again and, um, yeah, go from there. Go ahead, Mark. Another bucket in the same spot would be great. Another chopper coming in now with another bucket. I think what I find particularly surprising about this is the, the sheer effort that is required to control and extinguish these blazes. Look, this isn't, this isn't the inferno. It really isn't. But it can become one very quickly if they don't pay attention to every small bit of burn that's happening. Is the fire out in the in the trunk? Yeah, I think we're pretty safe to leave that one now. I sense that you love it. We do, we do. We rely on each other and yeah, it's good. The fact that it takes two water bucketing helicopters, a transport chopper, and three firefighters to extinguish a small hotspot within a single tree trunk indicates just what a formidable fire fuel eucalyptus is. But firefighters know their efforts are vital because if a blaze does take hold in eucalyptus forest, there's something unique about the way it spreads that can make it incredibly hard to control. Wow. Welcome to the CSRO Pyrotron, Kate. It's amazing, isn't it? This is the Pyrotron. It's a combustion wind tunnel, and at 25 metres long, one of the biggest in the world. It is like something out of a sci-fi movie. It's based in Canberra, where Dr Andrew Sullivan studies how wildfires behave by experimenting with different fuel types. Fires have been burning in Australia for millions of years. Yeah. Um, what we are developing is better ways of measuring and observing these fires. So is this the fuel down this here? This is the fuel down here. Today, he's staging an innovative experiment to analyse the nature of burning eucalyptus. Well, you see, you're much more random than me, OK. So just chuck it in. Once, once, once you put it in, you can then spread it around. OK. We're replicating a eucalyptus forest in miniature. At the base, we scatter leaf litter, dead, dry leaves that can collect for years on the forest floor. Hey, can you pass me that log, please? I can. Excellent. Thank you. Next, we add a tree trunk and fashion a road, which should stop the fire in its tracks. What we've got is a typical eucalypt tree trunk that's covered with a fairly fibrous bark, as you can see. The Pyrotron is rigged with temperature probes and heat-proof slow-mo and thermal imaging cameras capable of capturing what's invisible to the naked eye. Have you done this before in the no. Pyrotron? You no. haven't? No, this is the first time. <laughs> OK, well, let's get it going. Andrew ignites a line of leaf litter to create the head of the wildfire. Okay, fan on, lights off. The fuel condition that we've got, the, the wind speed that we've got, is all pretty much what, like what you'd find in the bush. All the flames are now leaning over unburnt fuel and that's accelerating the speed of the fire. 
a fan replicates the effects of a 12 kilometers per hour wind, bringing oxygen to the fire and propelling it forward. What's interesting is that it doesn't burn at a sort of consistent rate. And that's a, a, a property of the fuel in which we're burning. The slow motion cameras capture the precise way the fire spreads through this leaf litter. When the temperature reaches 300 degrees centigrade, the leaves break down, expelling a volatile gas which ignites, drawing the flames onwards. It appears the longer that it's burnt, that actually it seems to be speeding up, or is, is, is that just me making that up? What's happened is now we've got a, a full width of fire that's burning, and the whole width of the fire is now contributing heat to unburnt fuel, and that's increasing its speed. The fire gains momentum as the preheated, unburnt leaves ahead ignite more quickly. As the line of flames passes through, the thermal imaging camera reveals the threat behind is far from over. The leaf litter in its wake continues to smolder, and like the fire inside the tree at the Wallamai, each of these slow-burning hotspots is capable of reigniting into flame. But it's another type of fire behavior that makes eucalyptus wildfires so difficult to manage. The fire yeah. has ignited that, that fibrous bark and has yeah. burned around it. And bits and pieces of the bark have come off, crossed over our break, and has started a spot fire that is now developing as though it was a new, new fire, and independent of this fire. It yeah. didn't just jump the little break, no. it jumped quite a big distance. It did. This is a process known as spotting. Eucalyptus is native to Australia and having lived with wildfire for millions of years, it's evolved ways to survive the flames. When the tree's bark ignites, it quickly strips away so that flames cannot reach the core of the tree. These strips of bark become burning embers with temperatures up to 800 degrees centigrade. That was incredible. It was. And, th and this is the nature of fire in dry eucalypt forests with the stringy barks. They spot so prodigiously. Once the fire gets up and running and, and the ignition of those tree trunks happens, it's very difficult to do anything about them. I can see why now. We had one spot fire take off. Under really dry conditions, any of those embers could have started new fires and you would have had dozens of new fires start. Eucalyptus makes up 79% of Australian forests and it's the unpredictable way that eucalyptus fires spread that make them such a challenge. While the conditions in New South Wales start to cool, I'm in Winmalee, a town on the outskirts of a eucalyptus forest just north of Sydney. I'm meeting a couple who survived an ember storm during the October fires. They have astonishing evidence of why embers are such a threat to property and lives. Well, it's only three months later. And uh, driving around here, all you see is just these kind of devastated plots of land, which were clearly once people's homes. I mean, I'm just stunned by the level of devastation. Glenn and Carol Blackman have lived on this street for five and a half years. What was it like that day? Was it an incredibly oh, hot day? It, we'd had three months of incredible dryness, no mm -hmm. rain, and it was 40 degrees. It was just, it was a fire in waiting. I was inside and Glenn come rushing home and said, look, there's a fire and it's coming. Start getting prepared. The couple's eight home security cameras captured a unique record of a huge ember storm striking their house. And all of a sudden, Glenn said, oh my God, it's here. And the whole wall of fire, maybe a kilometre wide, 30, 40 foot high, just came straight for us. It yeah. just came like a blowtorch. The embers are hitting the house by this stage. And I'm saying to Glenn, come inside, you're going to burn, come inside. And I'm screaming at him and he's saying, I'll be right, I'll be right. 
Glenn started trying to extinguish the embers with a hose, but was soon forced inside. Ember attack is the biggest cause of house loss in a bushfire. These tiny superheated particles are capable of entering property through gaps in roofs, open windows or air vents. We're checking in the roof, checking around the doors for embers getting inside. So you're not just huddled on the floor? Oh, no. Oh. We had wet mops and we were going into the roof and putting embers out that were coming through the roof. And you're thinking all the time, is it on fire? Is it on fire? And you go into overdrive. Your heart's thumping. The fire alarms are whistling. You're not really concentrating. It's what you can do to stay alive. Even after the fire had passed over their house, the embers continued to do incredible damage. It was just like a war zone. All our sheds are on fire, Glenn's truck's on fire. Everything, Everything that could burn was burning. The fires destroyed over 200 homes. But the Blackmans' bravery and persistence meant they managed to save theirs. If another fire hit this area, how are you going to feel? It's not if it ever happens again, it's when. At the end of the day, it's the luck of the draw. We could have lost our home just as easy as our neighbours. We've witnessed the terrifying power and the unpredictable nature of wildfires and the huge challenges facing people trying to contain them. Next time, we'll see how cutting-edge science is being deployed in the battle against fire. So you're able to predict what I would think of as being unpredictable, a wildfire. Fires aren't unpredictable. Fires still follow the laws of science. We'll reveal the causes of the biggest and most extreme fires. By drawing air in just through those gaps, that causes the rotating motion that spins up to a high velocity. And we'll learn about the innovations needed to keep firefighters safe. We can already smell a little oh, look, bit of And actually, down. it's starting to smoke. So what is smoking?